can you hear me? Is that better? Okay. So as, uh, as, as we did yesterday, if you have questions, please interrupt, okay? Okay, so what I'd like to do today is go into some more of the details which I ignored yesterday, in particular related to uh, non-trivial response functions, non-trivial overlap uh, functions, uh, what to do if we can't cross-correlate detectors. What if we only have one detector? What do we do then? Which is the case for LISA. I'll also say a little bit about uh, using both frequentist and Bayesian methods to search for stochastic backgrounds and then, time permitting, uh, go through an example which is relevant uh, for LIGO, basically how one can go about uh, searching for the binary, <coughs> searching for the background from binary black hole mergers in an optimal way which takes into account the non-stationarity of the signal. Okay, so response functions. Uh, so yesterday we ignored uh, the response of the detector. We didn't care about uh, any frequency, polarization, direct, uh, direction, uh, dependence of the response. We basically assumed that everything uh, was, uh, you know, that the antenna was effectively uh, omnidirectional and frequency independent. Uh, we'd like to go beyond that today, okay? And we'll do that uh, in the context of what are called beam detectors. Uh, so a beam detector is any uh, detector that uses electromagnetic radiation to monitor the separation of two or more test masses, okay? Laser interferometers like LIGO or LISA, spacecraft Doppler tracking, pulsar timing, are all examples of beam detectors, okay? For laser interferometers, the test masses are mirrors, and you've got laser light monitoring the separation of those. For LISA, you've got little test masses housed inside the spacecraft with, again, lasers monitoring, monitoring the separation between those test masses. For spacecraft Doppler tracking, you've got one of the test masses being the uh, spacecraft, say Cassini, and the other test mass being effectively the Earth. While for pulsar timing, <coughs> here we've got a set of pulsars in the galaxy, and here we are uh, in the vicinity of the Earth. The test masses for that case are the pulsar and the, uh, the Earth itself. Now, the, the main idea here is that gravitational waves will perturb the, pr uh, the uh, uh, propagation time of a photon between the masses, and we look for that perturbation as evidence of a gravitational wave. Okay, so for example, in the context of pulsar timing, if we take one particular pulsar here and represent its world line, so time uh, increases vertically upward. Here we are, a radio uh, receiver here on Earth, its world line going upward here. The blue dotted line is the path of a, uh, a radio pulse from the pulsar in the absence of a gravitational wave, and the red wiggly curve basically shows its trajectory uh, in the presence of a gravitational wave. So what happens is that there's a uh, change in the time of arrival of the photon in the presence of a gravitational wave that differs from, um, from zero, from what we would expect it to be if no gravitational wave was present. This is an example of what I call a one-arm, one-way detector. And we'll see that basically um, these uh, spacecraft Doppler tracking, pulsar timing, and uh, laser interferometry are all similar in this respect. Okay, so for spacecraft Doppler tracking, <coughs> we've got uh, the Earth here, its world line, a spacecraft, say, out near uh, Saturn, and we send a, uh, a pulse of radiation, say radio waves again, from Earth to the spacecraft, that pulse then gets transponded back uh, to the Earth, okay? And relative to the nominal uh, uh, arrival time here, the uh, pulse actually comes back a little bit earlier in this particular example. So there's a change in uh, propagation time of the uh, round trip pulse, okay? So this is an example of a one-arm two-way detector, okay? So for laser uh, interferometry like LIGO, Virgo, or LISA, we basically have 
a two-arm, two-way detector. We've got um, the measurement here made at time t, and the delta t, the difference uh, uh, in, in, the, in the times due to the uh, presence of a gravitational wave is basically the difference in the times associated with down and back propagation along one arm here, and then similarly along the other arm there, okay? So they're all very similar in how they work. Now, if you read the literature, you'll see that there are different types of responses that are used, okay? So for pulsar timing, for example, one just takes the response uh, to be delta T, the timing residual, okay? For LIGO, you often hear H of T expressed as a strain, a delta L over L, okay? Where L is the nominal length, L of T is the length as a function of time <laughs> as the gravitational wave passes by. Okay, but delta L over L can also be expressed as delta T over T. So it's connected to the, um, the change in photon propagation time as well. Uh, for pulsar timing and spacecraft Doppler tracking, one often uh, hears uh, the, the, the word Doppler frequency as the uh, response of those types of detectors. For that case, you, you, you think of the a pulsar emitting uh, radio pulses at a certain frequency. The passage of the gravitational wave causes the observed frequency to differ slightly from the, uh, the emitted frequency. So there's a change in frequency relative to the nominal frequency, nu zero, which we can write in terms of delta t as a time derivative. Sh sure. In the first line, well, I'm, I'm, I, it, it's a definition, but yeah. So you can't object. It's a definition. Uh, you don't have no. That, that's that's the thing is that that uh, H of T does not have to be dimensionless. When you do pulsar timing analyses and they're working with timing residuals. Those timing residuals have units of time. The power spectra are not strain squared per hertz, but they're seconds cubed. Uh, well, this is, okay. Okay, 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 okay. But, but let's just take that as definition, okay? What I, what, what, I, what I define H to be, okay? It's not a strain, as you correctly point out. It's a response, okay? And it depends on what your detector is or how you define your detector. And for LISA, uh, people often talk about phase response. Okay, so this is a dimensionless thing, which is delta T times uh, nu zero, the uh, nominal frequency of the laser light. Okay, but the important thing to point out about uh, these responses is that they are all derivable from delta T. So if we know uh, the timing residual response of a beam detector, we also can easily get these other responses as well. Okay? Now, gravitational waves we know are weak. A detector converts metric perturbation to some sort of output, okay? And it does it in a linear way, okay? So we can think of a detector as a linear system which converts metric perturbations to the output, okay? Schematically, we can write it this way. So here's our input, the metric perturbations at some time t and spatial location x. We have our detector here, which is described by some response function, RAB of tau and y, which when we pass that input through the detector gives us what I call h, the detector output, okay? Now for a linear system, what is the uh, action of a detector on the input? How do you represent that mathematically? Anybody know? A matrix, but of what? Well, a, the, a, a linear system like this can be uh, described in terms of a convolution. Okay, you, you convolve the detector response with the input. Okay, so the detector output is really just the convolution of the detector response function here. Okay, or sometimes called the impulse response with the metric perturbations h, which I write sort of schematically or abstractly this way. 
Uh, in more definite terms, I can write it like this. Okay, so it's a convolution uh, integral over tau, t minus tau integral over y, x minus y. Okay? Now, h of t is the detector output, h tilde of f is its Fourier transform. If you make the substitution for h a b here, using this plane wave expansion that we had yesterday, okay, it turns out that you can write h tilde f as an integral over direction, sum over polarization, some detector response function which is related here to R A B of tau and y, and then you have the Fourier co coefficients h sub a, okay? That's not a hard calculation to do, I'm not going to do it here, okay? Just to save some time, but the interpretation of this R A is the detector response to a plane wave with frequency f uh, coming from direction n with polarization a. Okay? Now, the relationship between RA and this RAB is as follows. Okay? What we first do is we take RAB of tau and y and we do a Fourier transform both on the tau index and the, uh, the tau argument and the y argument. Okay? and then we multiply it by a uh, phase factor here which contains information about the location of the detector. Given this, which is just effectively the Fourier transform of this, we then contract it with the polarization tensor to get our RA here, okay? So this is the relationship that we want to use and maybe I'll write it down somewhere uh, for later use. So H tilde F is an integral d2 omega n sum over a r a of f and n h a. Okay. Any questions about this? Are people okay with that? Okay. So you could think of h a here as a proxy for h a b, the metric perturbations, and then this equation here is basically showing the action of the detector on the metric perturbations or these Fourier coefficients in order to give you the detector output in the Fourier domain. Okay. Now, to make this a little bit more precise, uh, not, not, not precise, uh, a, a little bit more tangible or concrete, we'll do an example. Okay. We'll calculate the, uh, the timing residual response for a one arm one-way detector which is relevant for pulsar timing, okay? So the idea here is we've got something at R1 which is emitting uh, electromagnetic radiation which propagates in direction U towards a, our detector which will be here at vector R2, okay? So you could think of this as the pulsar, this is the earth, and this is the uh, radial pulse sent from the pulsar to the earth. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to calculate h of t, which I define to be the delta t induced by the gravitational wave. Now, the delta t induced by the gravitational wave is basically the integral of the metric perturbations dotted into this unit vector, or the tensor constructed from the unit vector, so u a, u b, integrated along the photon path uh, from here to here, which if I take S to be arc length and I take this distance here to be L, I want to do an integral over S from zero to L, where inside the argument here for, for T and X, I can take the zeroth order trajectory of the photon, okay? Uh, I don't need to take its sort of perturbed trajectory because then that would give me a second order small term, okay? So to first order, I can just use this expression here, okay? And what I find if I do the integral is this, okay? This is actually a, uh, an exercise which I give you to do, okay? But before I lose the class here, uh, what I'm going to do is I'll show you basically how you can get this, okay? So we'll just go through the steps. We'll do that uh, on the board here, or at least I'll uh, sketch out the, 
the main steps. Okay. Okay. So remember, we ultimately want to uh, get the response function from this expression here. Okay. And we're going to start off with h of t given by this. Okay. So h of t is given by 1 over 2c ua ub integral ds from 0 to l hab of t of s and x of s. Okay? So what we have to do is we have to take this expression here and substitute it in here where for t I replace t by t of s is going to be t minus l over c plus s over c. Okay. So you note here that when s is 0, we have a time corresponding to, you know, to t minus l over c. So t is the time at which the detection is made over here. t minus l over c is when the photon left, say, the pulsar here at R1. Okay, and then we have x of s equal to r1 plus s u hat. Okay, so let's just look. So because we're doing an integral over s, the only thing we need to worry about is the s dependence in this expression here. Okay, and the only place that the s dependence shows up is here and here in the exponential. So we want to do an integral. So, so we're going to break this up. We'll do the integral over s, 0 to l, of the exponential part. So we have an exponential i 2 pi f. And now let's put the s dependent pieces here. So we're going to have an s over c from here. And over here, we're going to have an n dot s with the, uh, n dot, well, n n dot well, n dot s u over c okay so that's going to give you so you're going to get another s over c and then you're going to get an n dot u okay everybody see that so the first s over c comes from here and then this other term comes from the n dot n dot u over c okay now this is a very easy integral to do right it's just an integral of an exponential which is just 1 over i 2 pi f over c, um, 1 over 1 plus n dot u hat, integrated from 0 to l. So we're going to have exponential, I'll just write it, e to the i 2 pi f l over c, 1 plus n dot u, minus 1. Okay, and already you should see that we're getting more or less at least some of the terms here. Okay, the UA and the UB just come down nicely. The one half is over here. The one over I two pi f two pi f over here comes from over here, and then this C over here actually cancels that C over there, so there's no C in the denominator there. But yes. N hat, okay, I'm sorry, okay. Yeah, so N hat is the direction to the gravitational wave source. That's right, so N hat here is minus, uh, minus, no, uh, no, 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 no. A okay, so, so here, so the gravitational wave in this particular picture is shown propagating in direction K, N is equal to minus K. Sorry about that. Okay, and, and, and here it, it looks like it's coming from the z direction. It doesn't have to be, okay? So we just have a gravitational wave propagating in direction minus k, which is equal to n, n being the direction to the, the source. Okay, everybody okay with this? Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to pull out this exponential factor, so I'm going to get 1 over i 2 pi f over c, 1 over 1 plus n dot u. Yes. Yes. Uh, 
uh, where? That's right. Yeah. So I. Uh, so 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 there's always this question when you talk about direction k. Are you talking about the direction in which the wave propagates, or the direction to the source? I take k to be the direction in which the wave propagates, and n to be the direction to the s source. So they're related just by a minus sign. No, 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 no. It's uh, it's okay. It's actually okay. I can I can define the. I mean, my, the, the polarization tensor here can be defined in terms of n hat. Okay, okay. Now, actually, um, yeah, we, we can talk about this after if you want. Okay. Okay, so let me now take out the e to the i 2 pi fl over c 1 plus n dot u, and then I get 1 minus e to the minus i. 2 pi fl over c, 1 plus n dot u. Okay, so now we have we have this, we have this, we have the ea. You know, the eab comes from here. We've got the ua, the ub. We've got the half. We got this. Okay. The only thing we don't have is this. Okay. So how does that come? Okay. So I'm going to take this off. To get that part, what we need to do is take the uh, pieces of the exponential, which we didn't include before. So we have e to the i, 2 pi f, and then there's going to be a t minus l over c. Okay, that doesn't depend on s. And then we're going to have an r1 here, so n dot r1 over c. And then we have this stuff here, which is going to be plus L over C, 1 plus N dot U. Okay? So if I take the S independent stuff from here in the exponential and I multiply it by the exponential that I have here, this is what I get. And what you see is that the L over C's here cancel out, okay, which becomes E to the I. 2 pi f t, okay? And then we have e to the i 2 pi f l over c, uh, so let's see, uh, r1 uh, n dot r1 plus l u hat, okay? Now what is r1 plus l u hat? we go r1 and we take l u hat that gives us r2 okay so this here is just r2 which is the position of the detector okay normally one chooses coordinates in which r2 is at the origin uh, that simplifies things then that gets rid of this term okay but we see now where all the terms come from okay this is the e to the i 2 pi f over c n dot r r2 term and we've got the uh, this here and that. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so these are the types of calculations that one has to do. Yeah, but that, <laughs> it turns out that that actually gets, so it looks like there's a uh, sort of a singularity here when n dot u is minus one but you have to include what's going on here, okay? And that actually cancels out. That's a good question. The, yeah, yes, okay, and well, n n well, well, n well, okay. I, I, d I, d I, d I think the cancellation actually comes from here because normally for pulsar timing, what one does, at least for stochastic backgrounds, is one ignores this particular term, and one works with this, okay? And still, if one just works with this, okay, you get uh, something finite when n dot u is minus one, okay? But what you said, what you said is correct. If you just look at this, if you look at this here, the one over two pi f, right, just take this, this and this, you can write it as a sink function, right? And in the limit that uh, f 
L over C goes to zero. So for small uh, frequencies relative to uh, uh, C over L, uh, you find that, that, that this stuff here goes away and then all you're left with is this, okay? So in the long wavelength limit where uh, frequencies, um, wh where, where the uh, gravitational wave wavelength is large compared to say the, uh, the arm length of a detector, then uh, this formula simplifies, okay? Okay. Now, if we did not timing residual uh, response, but a, a, a Doppler frequency measurement, then we would need to differentiate delta T uh, by T. That would just bring down this factor of uh, two pi, uh, I two pi F, okay, which would cancel that. So this is equal to one for a Doppler frequency measurement. Uh, in the context of pulsar timing, that first term there is called the earth term. That second term is called the pulsar term. And typically this uh, pulsar term is ignored when one does stochastic background searches using uh, pulsar timing, okay? We don't typically know the uh, distances to, to pulsars very well, okay? This term here in the, the red dotted box, uh, we can just denote that by FA. It depends on N and U, okay? And if we plot the uh, square root of F plus squared plus F cross squared, okay, we get something like this, okay? It's rotationally symmetric around uh, this particular axis here. You could think of that as the, uh, the beam pattern function, if you will, for a, a pulsar in this direction here, say in the direction uh, north, okay, vertically up, for a gravitational wave propagating in that direction given by k hat. So again, in the notation that I'm using, n hat is minus k hat, and p, the direction to the pulsar, is minus u, the direction in which the radio pulse is propagating, okay? Yes? No, it goes to one. So you get maximum response when the gravitational wave and the photon propagate in the same direction. Okay. Right, right. That, that was the comment that somebody else made, uh, that, that you've got like something that looks singular here. But if you work out this part here in the numerator, they cancel out. Oh, sorry, let me turn this off, okay. So that was uh, the timing response for pulsar, uh, for pulsar timing. For LIGO, uh, in the short antenna limit or the long wavelength limit, uh, the response is, is actually uh, simpler, right? You don't have to worry about these one over one plus n dot u terms and things like that. You can write the response tensor in this simple way here u and v being unit vectors along the direction of the two arms of the interferometer, eab being the polarization tensor here. So that's the detector tensor. And if you plot the beam pattern function for that, <coughs> which is again the square root of r plus squared plus r cross squared, so basically um, the response to uh, an unpolarized gravitational wave, you see that it has this um, peanut pattern, which I think maybe John Beach or somebody else had showed earlier in the week, okay? Now, <coughs> you can also plot the uh, magnitudes of R plus and R cross individually, and this is what you get, okay, for these uh, two, uh, the, for these two responses. This is for the case, again, where we're working in the, um, the long wavelength or short antenna limit. And then this is just uh, the figure that I showed before. Now, <clears throat> uh, let me just go back here, okay? Now you see here that in this particular picture, the arms of the interferometer point, say in this direction here along the x-axis and this direction here along the uh, y-axis. The maximum response are for gravitational waves coming from the z-direction where this is big and you have no response for gravitational waves propagating along the bisector of 
uh, the bisector in the xy plane, okay? So if this is the x, x arm and this is the y arm, if the gravitational wave is propagating in the xy plane at 45 degree angles like that, you actually have zero response, okay? So the maximum response is directly overhead, okay, for the, um, for the interferometer, okay? So we can sort of draw what the, uh, what the antenna pattern looks like <coughs> on, uh, on the, the Earth here, okay? So for example, for Hanford, you see that you're going to have maximum response here, maximum response at its antipodal point, and then these are the, the zeros corresponding to the, uh, the, the bisector of the interferometer uh, arms, okay? Then for Livingston, the, uh, the maximum shifts to be above Livingston. Similarly for Virgo, the maximum shifts over there. For India, over there. And for Kagura in Japan, it's over there, okay? So basically, the, this is the, the sky coverage for the individual detectors for uh, um, unpolarized background of gravitational waves uh, for the different detectors on Earth. Okay, so we'll move now to non-trivial overlap functions, okay? So we have an expression now for the non-trivial response function for, uh, for timing residuals for delta T. <coughs> to calculate the, uh, the overlap function, what we're doing is we're cross-correlating data from two detectors. The uh, data from each detector is, you know, is, is, proportional to, is proportional to or depends on the response tensor R. So when you take the uh, correlation, you're gonna get something that's proportional to R squared, okay? But let me, uh, I, I guess I got too far into the math here. So let's, let's, let, let's say this a little bit uh, slower, okay? So what is, this, what is this overlap function, okay? So basically, and this is taken from Bruce's uh, Lezouche article, okay? So let's consider two detectors the detector in Hanford, Washington, another detector in Livingston, Louisiana. Now those two detectors are physically separated from one another, okay? And they have different orientations, okay? And because they're separated from one another and have different orientations, then they respond differently to a passing gravitational wave. The overlap function, which we get when we cross-correlate uh, data from these two detectors, basically encodes the reduction in sensitivity that comes from the physical separation and relative uh, alignment of those two detectors, okay? If the two detectors were sitting one on top of uh, another and were exactly aligned, then that, uh, that overlap function would be, uh, would be one, okay? The expected correlation, okay, between the data from two detectors. Okay, so I and J label the, uh, the detectors. So this is the output of detector I. This is the output of detector J at times T and T prime um, respectively. So then we take the, uh, their, the expected value of the product. So we correlate the two. And what you can show is that uh, in the time domain, you get something like this. So S, H of F, remember, is the uh, power in the, uh, in, in the gravitational wave background. This gamma here corresponds to the reduction in power due to the non-trivial response functions for each of the two detectors separately. This expression is written in terms of H of T and H of T prime. You can also write it in the frequency domain where things are a little bit more simple, okay? And you have basically this expression, which I wrote down uh, for the last lecture uh, and just told you to, to take that as, uh, as sort of a given fact, okay? So this SH, again, is the power in the gravitational wave, and this is basically a term that reduces this correlation away from the value that it would have had if the two detectors were coincident and co-aligned, okay? Now, let's see. The expression for gamma <coughs> in terms of the response functions for the two detectors is given by this. So as I mentioned uh, a, a little while ago, because each of the uh, detector outputs 
uh, depends you know, linearly on, on the R's. This quadratic expectation value depends quadratically on the R's from the two detectors in this particular way. Okay? And again, just to derive this, to, to show you that this is not something that is some mysterious thing, we'll just, we'll just derive it here. So remember, we had that H tilde of F could be written as an integral over the sky, a sum over polarizations, RA of F and N, HA of F and hat. Okay, let's just make sure that that's, I think that's right. Okay, so that's the expression for the uh, detector output. Uh, we'll do it first for detector I, okay? And then we'll have something similar for detector J. So now when we evaluate H tilde I F, H tilde J star F prime, because we're gonna work in the frequency domain because the expression is a little bit simpler there. We now take the expectation value of a product of something that looks like this. So we're going to have an integral over omega and hat, another integral over omega and hat prime, a sum over A, a sum over A prime. Then we're going to have R1, uh, RIA, F and hat, RJ, A prime star, F prime and hat prime, okay? And then we're gonna have the expectation value of H A F and hat with H A prime star F prime and hat prime. Okay, does everybody see that? All I'm doing is I'm taking this expression for H, which gives you the response of detector I to a gravitational wave described by this response function here. And I'm doing the same for detector J, and I'm just writing out that uh, expected value. The only thing that uh, is random here are the, the Fourier coefficients. So now for an isotropic, unpolarized, stationary background, okay? Isotropic, unpolarized, stationary background, we know what this is, right? It's one over 16 pi, delta F minus F prime, delta A A prime, delta two N N prime, and then we have S H of F, okay? So basically this delta function here that comes from stationarity, oh, did I miss a, no, no we're okay, okay? So we've got, we've got this, so we've got one over 16 pi, the delta F minus F prime comes outside because there's no integral over F. This delta A A prime is gonna kill one of the sums here. So that sum will go away, okay? Well, let me just, so one of the sums will go away. Uh, then we have uh, one of the integrals going away because N and N prime have to be the same. So we'll have an integral D2 omega N sum over A, R, I, A, F, N, over 16 pi. Um, R, J, A, star, F, and N, and then S, H of F. Okay, so all we're doing is we're, we're evaluating the expectation value here using the expectation values that we uh, expect for an isotropic, unpolarized, uh, uh, stationary uh, Gaussian background. Okay, and this is what we get. And if we compare here to this, uh, to this definition here, we see that we have 
you know, the one half delta f minus f prime, we can put a one over eight pi over here. Okay, and then we had, what did I erase? Integral d2 omega n. Okay, and what we see is that this expression here is what I call gamma, or define gamma ij of f. Okay, so basically it's an integral over the sky of this sum of products of response functions, okay, where you sum over the two different polarizations. Okay, so that's the expression for, uh, for the overlap function. Okay, thought of, <coughs> if you think of this here, this left-hand side as being the cross-correlated power in gravitational waves, you see that the uh, overlap function can be thought of as a transfer function that relates the cross-correlated power in gravitational waves to the autocorrelated power SH of F, okay? So this gamma here reduces what you would have just from the autocorrelated power uh, to the uh, cross-correlated power for two different detectors. When one is interested in looking for uh, anisotropic uh, stochastic background, what's relevant is not gamma of F itself, but actually the integrand, so this particular part here, okay? Now, in general, uh, this quantity here to, to actually do the integral over directions on the sky, uh, that would have to be done numerically, but there are some simple examples. Uh, for example, ground-based interferometers uh, in, the, in the short antenna limit you can actually calculate uh, an expression for gamma analytically. This was done by uh, Ana Flanagan and Nelson Christensen. Uh, the expression involves uh, some spherical Bessel functions, okay? You can also do the uh, integral uh, uh, analytically as well in the context of pulsar timing where one ignores that pulsar term, okay? So there are some cases where one can write down uh, analytic expressions for this function here, although in most circumstances one would have to do the integral numerically. Here's what you get if you take um, uh, the two LIGO detectors, one in Hanford and the other one in Livingston, working in the small antenna or long wavelength approximation. We're plotting things here on a logarithmic scale, okay, so log frequency goes here. And what you note here is that uh, you have a large negative value, okay? That's the first thing to note, okay? And that's because the interferometers are actually rotated relative to one another by 90 degrees, okay? So they're not actually exactly aligned. One is rotated by 90 degrees relative to the other, okay? So that's the reason why there's a minus sign here. The fact that this isn't minus one, but is minus 0.89, is due to the fact that the two interferometers are not in the same plane, okay? Because the Earth is curved, there's a, you know, the, there's a slight curvature, I think it's 27 degrees or something like that, the angle from the center of the Earth to Hanford and Livingston. The planes of those two interferometers are not perfectly, you know, they're, they're not aligned with one another, and hence, you know, even, even, um, even if they were properly aligned, this wouldn't be one, okay? So that's the reduction that comes here. Now you see also that the um, first zero in the overlap uh, function comes at a frequency of roughly 60 hertz, which corresponds to the speed of light divided by lambda, where lambda is equal to twice the separation of the two detectors, okay? So basically what this is saying is that <coughs> if the gravitational wave has a wavelength that's equal to, that, that's equal to or greater than twice the, um, um, has a wavelength equal to or greater than twice the separation of the two detectors, then those two detectors are driven in coincidence, you know, both by the, the same positive or negative part of the wave as the, uh, the wave passes by. So that's why here we have uh, the, uh, the overlap function having a, you know, a relatively large absolute 
absolute value. Once you, once you go to smaller wavelengths, right, so now instead of, um, you know, the positive values going from here to here, the positive values go from here to here, this interferometer will be driven positively by the wave, the other one will be driven by the negative part of the wave. Okay, so that gives you some intuition as to the, the, the meaning of this zero here. If you make the same overlap uh, uh, function plot for the Hanford and Virgo antennas working in the small, uh, Hanford and Virgo interferometers working in the small antenna approximation, you get something that looks like this. Note that the value is very, very small here, so very, very far from plus one or minus one. And that has to do with the fact that the two interferometers, uh, the Hanford interferometer and the Virgo interferometer, are actually sort of as misaligned as possible in the sense that um, they're, they're responding effectively to two orthogonal polarizations of the gravitational wave. Okay, so even at low frequencies, there's no um, uh, correlation here. The overlap is, is close to zero. Now, this gamma here, this lower case gamma, is a normalized version of the, uh, the gamma that I wrote earlier. It's normalized in the sense that at uh, zero frequency, if you had two coincident and co-aligned detectors, gamma should be one. I should have mentioned that earlier. Any questions? Okay, sure. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's good, a good point. Uh, it's, it's actually in the response function, okay? So the way that I define the response function, which some people might disagree with, um, let me just sort of jump here. You see that there's this there's this factor, okay? This factor here contains a, uh, contains the location of the detector, okay? Oftentimes, people will define the detector response function without this factor, and then it comes, this factor then would be uh, an extra term, okay? And if you did that, right, so if you go now and you write down the expression for the overlap function, there would be an exponential here, i 2 pi f, um, and then there would be a delta x, the difference, right, so there would be an n dot uh, vector x1 minus x2 or xi minus xj over, over c. No, that's, thank, thank you for that clarification. Okay. Now for pulsar timing, you can do the same thing. As I said, you can uh, do the calculation analytically. Uh, here I'm doing it for the Doppler frequency response where for pulsar timing, uh, there's no frequency dependence. If you go back and look at the expression that I wrote down for the uh, timing re uh, residual response for the uh, pulsar timing case, I mentioned there, there was a factor of one over I two pi F and this goes away if you work with Doppler frequency response. So what's being plotted here is not overlap as a function of frequency, but overlap as a function of the angle between a pair of pulsars, okay? So if you got a pulsar in this direction on the sky and a pulsar in this direction on the sky, and the angle between those two is 30 degrees, for example, then the overlap that you get would be given by this value here Okay, this is called the Hellings and Downs curve, named after the uh, two people who first wrote this down in 1983, okay? And it's very, I mean, it has, it's qualitatively similar to a cosine of two zeta, where zeta is the, uh, the angle between the, uh, the two Earth uh, pulsar baselines. And this two zeta dependence basically comes from the uh, quadrupolar nature of the gravitational waves. And one of the exercises that I give you uh, to do, uh, that I gave you last time, is basically to calculate the overlap function for a pair of 
short uh, co-located electric dipole antennas that point in uh, directions U1 and U2, so separated by an angle zeta, and do that for the case of an electromagnetic field which is unpolarized and isotropic. So you can play the same game that you would for, uh, for a gravitational wave background uh, for this electric dipole case. Uh, the assumption here that the, uh, the antennas are short allows you to work in the short antenna limit. And just as a hint, the response here uh, of this dipole antenna to an electromagnetic field is just given by ui dot e uh, of t and x, x naught, x naught being, say here, the, uh, the common uh, location of the two dipole antennas. So if you take this as the response and you make this plane wave expansion for the electric field and you take polarization tensors, uh, well, polarization vectors to be, say, theta hat and phi hat, and you turn the crank, you should find that the overlap function depends on the cosine of the angle. Okay? Okay. Yes, sure. Okay, so now I, I want to briefly say a few words about what you would do if you don't have multiple detectors to uh, cross-correlate. So, um, for example, how do we do uh, stochastic background analyses for LISA? Uh, next week you'll have uh, a couple talks uh, by Martin Hewinson and Alberto Sassana about LISA, so they'll go into more detail there. Uh, Next week, you'll also have Neil Cornish here, who is uh, an expert in data analysis for LISA, so you should uh, talk to him for, for more details if you want, okay? But basically, uh, LISA is a uh, space-based antenna, which uh, is, is um, proposed. Uh, hopefully, it will be launched around 2030 or 2034. It consists of uh, three spacecraft in an equilateral uh, configuration that orbits the sun, okay, trailing the earth uh, by about 20 degrees. So um, these, these spacecraft, which form an equilateral triangle, orbit the sun once a year, like, like the earth, but uh, sort of trailing the earth by about 20 degrees. Now the arm lengths of uh, LISA, I think now are two and a half million kilometers long. Uh, so it basically takes a uh, laser light, a little bit less than 10 seconds to go from one arm to the other, okay? So this is a rather big <laughs> uh, uh, equilateral triangle because remember, it takes uh, light a second or so to go back, back and forth between the Earth and the Moon, okay? So this is a, uh, a big uh, interferometer. Because it's a big interferometer, it's sensitive to lower frequency gravitational waves, as we, uh, we talked about last time. So it will be uh, sensitive to the more massive, uh, more massive systems. Okay? Now, there are little uh, test masses housed in these two spacecraft here. The spacecraft just uh, effectively act to uh, keep the uh, test masses from being uh, sort of buffeted by uh, uh, any uh, external disturbances. And then what the laser light is doing is it's monitoring the separation between a test mass here and a test mass there. Okay? Now, <coughs> you might think that uh, you can do cross-correlation uh, uh, using LISA, uh, but it turns out that it's not really an option, uh, at least at low frequencies. And that's because although there are three vertices corresponding to the three spacecraft, and hence you can form three Michelson interferometer combinations, which we'll denote here by X, Y, and Z, okay? So you've got uh, an interferometer with a 60 degree opening angle here, X, similarly for Y, and then one for Z. It turns out that they have common noise because they share, right? So X and Y share this arm, X and Z share this arm, Y and Z share this arm. So the noise would be correlated. And remember, the assumption that we were working with uh, last time was that we were doing cross correlations, <coughs> assuming that the detector noise was uh, uncorrelated. Now, you can do cross correlations, you know, using uh, correlated, you know, 
allowing for correlated noise. But it turns out that you can <coughs> actually take the covariance matrix, which has initially off-diagonal terms for x, y, and z, and then diagonalize that covariance matrix to get data combinations that are noise orthogonal. Okay, so although x, y, and z are, have common noise and are correlated, okay, and have uh, off-diagonal terms in the, uh, the covariance matrix, these particular combinations A, E, and T, which are given in terms of X, Y, and Z by these formulas here, are actually um, noise orthogonal. But <coughs> they're also orthogonal to signal as well. So the, uh, the, the, the diagonalization not only sort of kills the uh, correlation between the noise, but it does it uh, as well for the uh, signal. Okay, the A and E combinations here can be thought of as two Michelson interferometers that are rotated relative to one another by 45 degrees. So one of the interferometers would be sensitive, say, to plus polarization, the other to cross, and hence if you try to cross-correlate them, you get zero. This uh, third combination, T, is what's sometimes called a SANYAC uh, combination or SANYAC channel. And that turns out to be relatively insensitive to gravitational waves, again, at least at low frequencies. And hence, one can actually use this as a null channel. Okay? It's not sensitive to gravitational waves. So you can look for gravitational waves as excess noise, if you will, in the, uh, the A and E channels. Okay? Now, even though you can't do correlation, <coughs> you know, cross-correlating A and E or A and T or E and T. It turns out, and, and this is something that Neil and his student uh, Adams did back in 2010 and 2014, that if you have a proper model of your instrumental noise, which you know, one might question, and you have a proper model of the astrophysical uh, foreground and, and gravitational wave background that you're uh, looking for, then you can discriminate, you can separate uh, uh, the, the components and get come up with an estimate of the uh, the strength of the say the cosmological gravitational wave background. Okay, um, <coughs> and this was done by uh, as I said Neil and and his student Adams in 2010 and 2014. Uh, for detailed questions, please ask Neil. He'll be coming either this weekend or or, or, or next week. Now let me just show you though um, some plots here. Uh, to illustrate what's going on, okay? <laughs> so this is a plot of simulated LISA data, okay? The red here shows the signal that you get if you include the, uh, the full galaxy, which means uh, uh, these close white dwarf binary systems that are sufficiently large that you can actually resolve them. You can individually detect those binaries. So, th so this is a very large signal, okay? The green here shows you what's left after you subtract off the resolvable ones. So the green is the uh, confusion limited signal left over from the galactic white dwarf binaries when you subtract out the, uh, the resolvable ones, okay? But still, it's this green one is much greater than the instrumental noise which is shown here in blue, okay? And I showed that last time as well. There was, there is this modulation with a period of uh, six months that has to do with the orbit of uh, LISA around the sun at two times during the year. It's maximally sort of pointing toward the, uh, the center of the galaxy. This uh, light pink uh, trace here is for a simulated gravitational wave background with a level of five times 10 to the minus 13, okay? So you see you've got this modulated confusion noise from the galactic white dwarf binaries. You've got the instrumental noise here, and then you've got the gravitational wave background. So this is a foreground, this is a background, this is the instrumental noise, okay? And what you're going to do, according to uh, Adams and Cornish, is you're going to use this, this distinction. You're gonna use the fact that the, uh, the, the confusion limited uh, foreground here is modulated as a way to discriminate 
uh, this signal, say, from this one here. And you're going to use differences between the, instrument, uh, the instrumental noise power and the uh, expected power from the gravitational wave background and the astrophysical uh, foreground. Okay? And that's shown here in this particular figure. So here we're plotting frequency and power. So power is a function of frequency. And we've got uh, several traces here. Okay? So the red here is the instrumental noise, okay? which goes like this. Okay. The blue here, this and this, show the astrophysical foreground at two different times during the year. One when Lisa is pointing uh, in the direction of the, uh, the galactic center, the galactic plane, where the magnitude is large. And then this is at a, uh, at a different time of the year where the amplitude of the signal is smaller. And then in uh, green here, you've got the, uh, the uh, co cosmological background, the gravitational wave background that's at this very low level. Okay? So it's this distinction between the, uh, you know, the modulation, the foreground relative to the background and, and relative to the uh, instrumental noise, and also the, uh, the differences in the spectra that will allow you to discriminate the different components. Okay? Sort of similar to what I showed at the end of uh, lecture last time, where I was able to separate the contributions uh, from the, uh, for the, um, the white gravitational wave background and the, uh, the, the gravitational wave background corresponding to uh, overlapping binary neutron, uh, neutron stars. Okay? Those had different spectra, and, and because of the different spectra, I was able to extract one from the other. Yes. 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 Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes. Yes. One one person's signal is another person's noise. <laughs> okay. So now let me sort of turn uh, uh, the discussion around a little bit and discuss uh, frequentist and Bayesian methods. Now, the lecture uh, yesterday, I focused mostly on frequentist methods, so different statistics, cross-correlation statistics, et cetera. Now I want to discuss things from a more Bayesian perspective. Okay? So let me begin first by just sort of comparing uh, the two. So uh, as a frequentist, uh, your interpretation of probability is as a long-run relative occurrence of outcomes of repeatable experiments. Okay? So you assign probabilities to random variables, okay? things that have intrinsic randomness. You can't assign, you should not assign probabilities to hypotheses that have fixed but unknown values. Okay? So if your hypothesis has a fixed but unknown value, okay, you can't assign it a probability if you're a frequentist. From the Bayesian perspective, probabilities are degrees of belief. Okay? and hence can be assigned to, to, to hypotheses. Okay? So the hypothesis that a gravitational wave you know, passed through this room right now, uh, I can assign a, uh, a, a, a I, I, I can assign a value to that probability in the context of, uh, of, of this idea of degree of belief. As a frequentist, uh, the, the, the basic idea is to come up with statistics, so functions of the, the data that you can use to estimate parameters or decide whether or not uh, you've detected something. Uh, but usually, you start off with a likelihood function uh, to construct your statistics, where the likelihood function is just the probability of the data given some hypothesis where this hypothesis can be some model with certain values of the parameter. Uh, a Bayesian also starts uh, with uh, a, likely, uh, a likelihood function as well. 
Uh, for frequentists, uh, you basically construct statistics, as I just mentioned, uh, to do parameter estimation for hypothesis testing, ruling on whether uh, you know, this, uh, this particular model is valid or not. Uh, from a Bayesian point of view, you need to specify priors, which is uh, prior probability distributions on the parameters and the hypotheses that you're considering, whereas from a frequentist uh, point of view, they don't enter uh, the picture at all. In frequentist statistics, what you need to do is you need to calculate the probability distribution of the statistics that you write down. Okay? Sometimes you can do that uh, calculation analytically. Most of the time you have to do that numerically by simulating uh, multiple copies of the data and, for example, uh, as, as one does in LIGO, use time slides to produce different realizations of, uh, of noisy data. Uh, for a Bayesian, on the other hand, what you do is you use Bayes' theorem okay, to basically take your prior degree of belief in a particular uh, hypothesis or model and update that in light of uh, new data. A frequentist calculates confidence intervals on parameters and p-values to decide whether to accept or reject a particular model. For a Bayesian, what you do instead is you construct posterior distributions for your parameters and you calculate odds ratios or base factors to compare one model to the other. Okay, so this is a very brief uh, one, one slide uh, summary comparing frequentist and Bayesian inference. Now, as I said, the likelihood function <coughs> is the starting point for both fre uh, frequentist and Bayesian analyses. The likelihood function is the probability of the data given uh, a, a set of uh, parameters corresponding to a particular model. Uh, for, a Gaussian, for Gaussian detector noise and a, uh, a Gaussian gravitational wave background, the likelihood function is, this, is given by this multi, these multivariate Gaussian distributions shown here. Uh, the difference, okay, so for the noise only model, which I denote here by M0, and the signal plus noise model, which I denote here by M1, the only difference in these expressions is that one has Cn and the other has C. So Cn is the noise covariance matrix, whereas C here is the covariance matrix of the data, which consists both of signal and noise, okay? So if you were to think of uh, the covariance matrices, for the uh, simple example where you had n samples of white noise and a white gravitational wave background, ignoring any complication that comes from response functions or overlap functions. So we're going to work with co-located and co-aligned detectors. This is what you would write down for the uh, covariance matrix for the noise, assuming that there's no correlations between detector one and detector two. And this is the covariance matrix that you would write for the signal plus noise model, where you have both detector noise but a gravitational wave background present. And note that this SH appears uh, not only in the cross-correlation terms but in the autocorrelation terms as well. Okay, so that's uh, a likelihood function which is used by both frequentist and Bayesian analyses. Uh, so from a frequentist point of view, what you would then do is you would take uh, the, the, the maximum of the likelihood ratio. So you um, use that as a detection statistic, and you take the parameters that you get by maximizing the likelihood as the estimators uh, that you use for those parameters. So more explicitly, <coughs> these are your likelihoods for the signal plus noise model. This is your likelihood for the, uh, the noise only model here. You maximize this likelihood with respect to the signal plus noise parameters. You maximize the likelihood here for the noise only parameters and then you divide, okay? So that's the maximum likelihood ratio detection statistic. If you take twice the logarithm of that and you look at that in the limit where the signal is weak uh, relative to the noise for the stochastic background case, you can actually show that this is what you get, okay, which is just the square of the um, power signal-to-noise ratio in the cross-correlation statistic. 
So if you go back and you look at slides from yesterday, you'll see an expression similar to this, but the square root of that, that was the expression for the signal to noise ratio. The maximum likelihood estimators <laughs> that you get when you do the maximum here and the maximum here, you can show at least for the case, uh, well, for the case where you've got both signal and noise present are given by these expressions here. So this is again something that we wrote down last time. This turns out, uh, this cross correlation statistic is actually the statistic, uh, is, is actually the combination of the data that maximizes the likelihood together with these expressions as well, okay? Note that <coughs> to get a, um, uh, an estimator for SN1 and SN2, you have to take the, uh, the, uh, the covariance that comes from the data itself and then subtract off the contribution that comes from the gravitational wave uh, contribution as well because D consists of both signal and noise. Okay, is that okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, I gave two exercises uh, related to this. One is to verify that these actually, that these particular estimators here uh, are actually maximum likelihood estimators for uh, the likelihood uh, function that, that we wrote on the, the previous slide. And then also the exercise to verify that uh, this expression here for the uh, detection statistic reduces to this simple value when you make the, uh, the substitution for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the maximum likelihood parameters. Okay, so from a Bayesian point of view, uh, we use Bayes' theorem to calculate posterior distributions for parameter estimation, and then we calculate odds ratios or base factors to do uh, model selection to choose one model over another. This is something that John Veach wrote down, Bayes' theorem <coughs> relating uh, the likelihood function here, the prior probability distribution, and then the posterior uh, distribution for the hypothesis given the data. Posterior distribution, so if we, if we take our H to be, say, the, uh, the parameters SN1, SN2, and SH for our signal plus noise model, then this sort of generic expression for the likelihood uh, has this particular form here, okay? So this is the likelihood function here, this is the posterior, this is the prior, and this is the so-called marginalized likelihood or evidence of model M1. If you're interested <coughs> in just this single parameter SH and you don't care, well, and you, you, you don't necessarily care about SN1 and S2, then what you need to do is take this joint posterior distribution and then just integrate over uh, SN1 and SN2. So this joint uh, posterior has all the information that you need to get the individual posteriors by integration. For model selection, what you do is you compare <coughs> the posterior for model M1, given the data, to the, po uh, the posterior for model M0, given the data. Uh, you can write that as this ratio over here. These are the prior uh, PM1 over PM0 is the prior odds for model uh, M1 to, to model M0. And this factor here, multiply, multiplying the prior odds, is called the Bayes factor. So it's the evidence for model 1 divided by the evidence uh, for model 0. Okay, and usually we take that, you know, under the assumption that there's no preference for model one relative to model zero a priori, then the posterior odds is just the, the base factor, okay? And you can relate the, the Bayesian and Frequentist analyses in, 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 in the following way. <coughs> Note that the base factor is just a ratio of these two, um, two marginalized likelihoods. So marginalizing the likelihood means to take the full likelihood with the parameters written explicitly here, multiplying by the prior, okay, and then integrating over those values for the parameters, okay, and then you do this something similar for uh, the noise-only model, okay. So 
A base factor is a ratio of marginalized likelihoods, whereas for a frequentist, the maximum likelihood ratio is a ratio of maximized likelihoods. Okay? So here we're taking a ratio of marginalized likelihoods as opposed to taking a ratio of um, uh, maximized likelihoods. Now, in the, in the case where the data are informative, which means that the likelihood function is peaked relative to the prior, then what you can show is that, uh, I think this is called the Laplace approximation, you can basically just evaluate this integral at the maximum likelihood values, which then gives you a ratio of the, uh, the values of the likelihood functions where you substitute in their maximum likelihood values and you get this expression here and then you get a, a multiplicative factor which is sometimes called an Occam's factor which relates the um, uh, the parameter volume that you need to fit the data relative to the uh, uh, the parameter volume that you had initially okay so what this expression is showing here that the base factor is basically equal to the maximum likelihood ratio times some factor here, which is a, uh, an Occam's factor. So doing things from a Bayesian point of view or a frequentist point of view, at least if the data are informative, is not going to uh, change your, uh, you know, your statement about whether you've detected gravitational waves or not. Uh, let me, uh, no, I, I, I need to, to, to go, uh, through this, I'm afraid that I'm running a little uh, short on time. But uh, the point that I want to make, and this is relevant for uh, the discussion of uh, uh, the, this, this alternative uh, approach uh, given by uh, Rory, S Rory Smith and Eric Thrain, is <coughs> I need to uh, basically, let's see, I need, to, I need to be able to talk about signal priors and how signal priors uh, uh, can be uh, incorporated into the analysis. So here <coughs> I have a, a generic likelihood function, okay, so probability of the data uh, given, say, the uh, noise covariance matrix and some signal model, okay, and the signal model can either be for a deterministic signal or a stochastic signal. That likelihood function is just given by the uh, probability distribution for the noise. So you take the data and you subtract off your signal model, okay? If your signal model is correct, this should just be effectively detector noise and hence is given by this probability distribution here, okay? So the likelihood function can be written as the probability distribution for the noise where the noise here is the residual, the difference between uh, the data and your uh, signal model, okay? So this CN here is the covariance matrix for the noise. So for example, it's just this here, okay? Now, <coughs> typically for stochastic signals, we don't care about the signals, the, the, the individual signal samples, okay? Those are random, they're jumping around. So what we do is instead of caring about H, we would like to know rather the, um, the width of the distribution or the variance of those, uh, of those samples, okay? So the stochastic signal model would be a probability distribution for the signal samples given some SH, which would be this. So this, 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 is, just the, um, this is just the Gaussian distribution here, okay? And to get the marginalized likelihood, what we do is we take this generic likelihood here, which depends, or, or, or this expression here, which depends on CN, the noise covariance matrix in H. We multiply it by the stochastic signal model, which is this, and then we integrate over H, okay? And when we do that, we get something that only depends on CN and SH. The H dependence has gone away, okay? And the claim is, and I'm asking you to do this as, as sort of the final exercise, is that if you do this marginalization over H, you recover 
the standard likelihood function for a stochastic signal where this d here are now the data, okay, it's not d minus h, it's just the data here, and this covariance matrix C is the full covariance matrix for the data, which consists of the signal, uh, signal components here and the noise on the uh, diagonal. Okay. Signal priors define the signal model. So just as we said for the stochastic case, right, we take as our signal prior this probability distribution for the signal samples H, okay? If we had a deterministic signal, we could write down something like this, that the, uh, the signal samples are determined precisely, okay? So for example, if our signal model is uh, a sine wave with a particular amplitude, frequency, and start time, uh, our uh, signal prior would just be a delta function. Right, the H is given precisely by this, whereas for this prior here, the H is given by a draw from that distribution. Okay. One can consider hybrid models in the sense that <coughs> we can take a uh, prior for H that depends on several parameters. The C here is basically a, a, a probability. So uh, C percent of the time, we take the, uh, the signal samples to be deterministic, like this, and one minus C uh, percent of the time, we take the signal samples to be zero. So for example, <coughs> uh, and this, is, this will be relevant for the, uh, the non-stationary search, which, which, which I'll explain in just a few minutes. Uh, if, if you want to allow for the case for a particular segment of the data, to either contain a particular signal or not, you can use this as your signal prior. Okay. Okay. So let me let me conclude then with the example uh, how one can search for the uh, background from binary uh, black hole mergers, and we'll we'll use this uh, this idea uh, to do that. Now recall uh, from last time that um, we expect uh, in uh, we, we expect using advanced LIGO to, uh, to be able to see a, uh, a signal from binary black hole mergers throughout the universe. That signal is highly non-stationary um, as the signal duration is uh, short compared to the average separation between the signals, okay? Smith and Thrain uh, in this particular paper have uh, proposed a method uh, that one can use to search for this uh, signal from the binary black hole mergers, which is optimally suited for the, uh, the non-stationarity of the signal, okay? Typical, uh, uh, well, the, uh, the estimate that I gave last time that it would take 40 months uh, to, to, to see this is based on our standard cross-correlation statistic, which assumes that the the signal is on all the time. Um, Smith and Thrain are now proposing a method that um, doesn't assume that, uh, uh, that, that the signal is, is stationary. They describe the, the background using a hybrid signal model similar to what I showed uh, on the previous slide. They are only interested in the rate of mergers, okay, even though these uh, signals are given by uh, uh, binary black hole mergers and hence are described by a, a, a chirp waveform. They uh, effectively average over those chirp parameters to infer only the rate of the mergers. And although they don't need to use two detectors, they do use two detectors in order to discriminate against glitches. Okay. So the mathematical details is this. They basically take the data and they split it up into uh, short segments. Uh, typically four seconds long, okay, which should contain at most one binary black hole merger, okay? Remember, binary black hole mergers uh, typically last around a second or so, and one expects the separation to be, you know, something like one per minute uh, or more. Yes, sorry. Uh, well, no, no, no. So, so, so that could have. I think they would have more trouble if there were mul mul multiple ones. I mean, you can you can do the case where you've got multiple mergers in a segment, but 
but at least for this particular analysis, they assumed that the, uh, the segment duration was short uh, and that the segment duration was sufficiently short that they wouldn't have, have tuned. Okay, so the likelihood function <coughs> is this. So it's just the generic likelihood function that we had before. And their signal model is this hybrid signal model, which basically says C percent of the time, the signal is given by a binary black hole chirp. And the rest of the time, one minus C percent, it's zero, okay? So they basically allow either a chirp to be in that segment or nothing, no gravitational wave to be in that segment. So then what they do is they take, the, um, they take this uh, signal model, multiply it by the, uh, the likelihood function here, and they marginalize over H, okay? And when they do that, okay, when you take this and you put it here and you multiply this here and you do the integral over H, basically you get C times this where H is given by the chirp signal here. And then you get one minus C times P and D, the H is zero, okay? So this delta function kills the H here, gives you this, uh, this term. And this uh, delta function here replaces H with this chirp signal, okay? This is an example of what's called a mixture Gaussian distribution because each of these are Gaussian here. And then you've got a probability parameter C and one minus C, okay? They then take this marginalized likelihood and they marginalize it again, okay? So they average over the uh, chirp parameters and when they average over the chirp parameters, they basically, so this term here, when they average over the chirp parameters, that will be, let's call this thing S, okay? When they average over the chirp parameters here, that's, let, let's call that N, there's no chirp parameter dependence here. So basically they get something for the signal part, so C times S plus one minus C times N which we can just write this way. So S minus N, C plus N. So this marginalized likelihood is a very simple function of C, okay? It, it, it's, a, it's a linear function that either has positive slope or negative slope, depending on whether the data is more consistent with a signal or more consistent with noise. The posterior is just given by the likelihood multiplied by the uh, prior on this uh, probability parameter C, which they usually take just to be, um, wh wh which will take just to be uh, flat to begin with, okay? And then you can combine segments. So this is for a particular segment. You can then combine the segments by multiplying uh, the likelihood functions together, okay? So basically this is the, uh, for the case where the prior is flat, uh, basically, the posterior is just some linear function in C, okay? So I did this case for some simulated uh, data, uh, which you can get uh, from, the, uh, from the GitHub repository that's linked to uh, from the Lazouche page, okay? And if I do the uh, analysis for some simulated signals in noise, I recover a rate of about 25%. Uh, which is consistent for the number of injections that I put here in the data, okay? So basically for this, I've got 10 seconds of data. I split the data up into quarter uh, second segments <coughs> and I did the analysis there. And I've injected basically 10 signals uh, in, in that 10 seconds worth uh, of data. So 10 signals in 40 segments gives us sort of this. Okay, now if you do the calculation of the signal to noise ratio using, you know, for this particular non-stationary analysis, you get something greater 15.3 as opposed to what you would get if you just use the standard uh, optimal filter analysis that assumes a Gaussian um, stationary signal. Now just to understand what's going on, <coughs> What I'm showing here are posterior distributions for uh, individual segments for the first four seconds of data. So this is for the first quarter second, the next quarter second, et cetera. 
and you see that they're just straight lines with slopes that are positive or negative. And they're positive or negative precisely with whether or not <laughs> there was a signal injected into the data. So I, this, this signal, even though it's buried in noise, is actually quite strong. And if you look at what's on the next slide, you'll see that there's a positive slope for this segment, positive slope for this segment, negative slope for that segment, et cetera. Okay? So you get something like this, okay? So that's for the first two seconds of data. Now what you need to do is you need to then combine the posterior distributions over the different segments. And if you do that, for the first segment, the second segment, three segments, four segments, five segments, 10 segments, 20 second segments, 30, 40, you get this, okay? So just multiplying those posterior distributions for the individual segments ultimately converges uh, on the, uh, you know, on the, on, on the true answer for this particular example, okay? So that's the idea that underlies uh, their analysis. Their analysis reduces the time to detection from 40 days to, to one day, as they claimed in their paper, because of uh, a couple of things. First of all, all their segments contribute to the estimation of this uh, probability or rate parameter C, okay? For the standard uh, Gaussian stationary analysis, those segments that don't contain a signal only add variance, only add uh, uh, effectively, only increase the variance of your estimator and hence reduce the signal to noise ratio. For their analysis, because they're interested in estimating the parameter C, those segments that uh, don't contain uh, a signal are as equally interesting as those that do. The other key uh, uh, distinction is that their analysis is basically a matched filter analysis uh, that takes into account that the signal is a chirp signal. So it's a deterministic analysis for each segment and not a stochastic analysis. You're not just looking for excess correlation, okay? And if you then <laughs> take these two, uh, th take these two statements here and you convert it into a statement relating signal to noise ratio for the non-stationary analysis uh, relative to the signal to, to noise ratio for the stationary analysis, you get something that scales this way, okay? Now, this right now is conjecture. I, 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 I believe it's true, but I haven't been able to rigorously prove uh, this factor here. This n cycles would basically be uh, incorporating this statement here that you're doing, a, or they're doing an analysis that takes into account the, uh, the deterministic nature of the signal. Uh, this parameter here, uh, probability parameter, is related to the duty cycle of the signal. Now, <coughs> If you substitute in numbers, relevant numbers, something like uh, number of cycles is 10 and then uh, a duty cycle of one over 100, which is uh, relevant for the LIGO data, you actually find that the time to detection is reduced by a factor of 1,000, which is the square of this, okay? Signal to noise ratio grows like the square root of the observation time. So the observation time is reduced by the, the square of this. So basically, <coughs> we hope to see something in a much shorter time than what we would have seen if we, uh, if we did the analysis just assuming that the signal uh, is, is, is on continuously, okay? So basically, <coughs> once O3 starts and we have this analysis uh, up and running, uh, we, it might not be very long uh, before we detect something. So stay tuned uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the archive or to, uh, to papers because hopefully we'll be detecting stochastic background not in the not too distant future. Okay, thank you. Oh. Uh, well, the 01 and 02 data are, are not going to, so, so this 40 month thing uh, is basically taking into account uh, the, the better sensitivity for the, you know, for 03 and, and, and future runs. Um, but yes, you can, you can go back and reanalyze the data that we took from 01 or 02 using this improved method. 
so that's something that uh, will be will be done. The uh, analysis has not yet been implemented fully uh, yet. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. So so with because the O1 and O2 sensitivity are not as good as what you know we expect going forward, it will take more than a day. Okay, okay. So I'll stop here. Sorry for going over.